how do you do? Welcome to another episode of 10 Minute Philosophy, the show that's bringing the tools of critical thought to the 21st century, 10 minutes at a time. Hope you all had a nice new year. Good to see you. Today's topic is one of my favorites. It's a theory called false consciousness. Now, this theory is a little bit of a tricky one because it sits between philosophy, sociology, and psychology, so I'm just going to lump it all together under the heading of behavioral science. All right. So, this is originally a Marxist idea, although it's worth noting that it doesn't seem that Marx himself ever actually mentioned it, or maybe he did mention it, but he never wrote it down. So, while it may not be accurate to attribute the phrase false consciousness to Marx, it's clear from his writings that he thought quite a lot about the relationship between society, the individual, and power. The only evidence in print that this phrase is attributable to Marx actually comes from his right-hand man, Frederick Engels. Engels famously coined the term in an 1893 letter in which he said, Ideology is a process accomplished by the so-called thinker. Consciously, it is true, but with a false consciousness. The real motive impelling him remains unknown to him. Otherwise, it would simply not be an ideological process. All right, so that's a decent start, but let's try to dig in a little bit more. First question, what exactly are we talking about here? Well, let's begin by defining false consciousness as the case in which an individual or group willfully participate in their own oppression. Another way to think about it is that it's a conditioned state of mind or a sense of self-identity that prevents a person from recognizing the injustice of their present social situation. To contextualize this a little bit, let's back up and look at how Marx viewed the relationship between the individual, and society. As he said, it's not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but, on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. What Marx is going for here is a simple recognition of the impact of culture on the individual sense of self. Putting it differently, you, your sense of identity, your dispositions, your taste, and, most importantly, your political and economic outlook is, by and large, a product of where you happen to end up in the story of history and culture. So an easy thought experiment. Let's say we take a three-day-old child and have that three-day-old child adopted by a lovely couple in Beijing. If we were to check on that child in 30 years, we wouldn't be surprised if that baby grew up to speak Chinese, like Chinese food, and probably belong to a Chinese religion. Or if that child was raised in Paris, they'd most likely be French. Or if we put them in New Jersey, apparently they'd be a dickweed. The point here isn't necessarily to argue for some type of cultural determinism, but rather to frame the impact of culture on the individual identity. To clarify what we mean here, let's take a random sample from an imaginary country of blue people. So, you would expect a small percentage of this country to branch out and perhaps adopt different cultures. Nothing surprising here, but for our purposes it's important to recognize two things. One, only a small percentage of the population will be able to do this, and two, that percentage will probably have ample access to wealth, education, or both. It's also not that significant of an observation to say that a baby raised in a random culture will most likely adopt the conventions of that culture. The part that Marx is interested in isn't necessarily the relationship between various cultures, but rather to notice how any random culture manages to keep various groups within it in their respective positions in the hierarchy of their society. According to Marx, societies maintain their social order by imbuing their members with a particular set of ideas and values that, when taken as a whole, can be seen as a mechanism which allows the dominant class to continue its domination. Indeed, for Marx, you can go to any society in history and you'll find this dynamic at work. Over and over again, we see the vast majority working for the benefit of a small minority. Whole civilizations, indeed the majority of civilizations, distributing resources in a sharply slanted and unsustainable way. According to Marx, when you're looking at a culture anywhere in history, all you have to do is identify which group dominates all the others, and then you can see that their politics, art, religion, philosophy, and economy are all based on one general premise, and that is the justification of this inequality and the maintenance of this power. So, let's go back to our first definition of false consciousness as a case in which an individual or group will willfully participate in their own oppression. The way this happens, according to the theory, is that people are taught to value things that are actually bad for them. 
This is to say, false consciousness is the case in which someone is taught to admire something that does them more harm than good. So let's look at some easy examples of this. The first most obvious case of this sort of behavior is cigarettes. Why would anyone who's read anything in the last 50 years smoke? The evidence against them is overwhelming. Tobacco kills over 480,000 people in the U.S. alone every year. Yet, people just keep lining up to buy these things. Why? Well, one obvious answer I think we all know is that tobacco companies spent decades telling generations of Americans that this highly addictive, nasty, dangerous habit was nothing but a bucket of awesome sauce, and that all the cool kids are doing it, so why not you? Another example that always kind of perplexed me, why do women wear high heels? Again, the obvious answer is because, in my culture at least, they're taught that high heels are beautiful and they're worth the two to $800 a pair that they charge for the high-end versions. But again, the evidence against these is overwhelming. These things are horrible for your feet. And it's not just America. In some Asian cultures, women do something called foot binding. This is a practice of intentionally breaking your feet over and over again for years warping them into a particular shape because these small, barely functional feet are considered to be beautiful. Okay, so let's move on. Sorry, I know looking at broken toes is not the funnest thing to do. Let's take it back to some simple examples um, of hierarchy in society. So to keep it brief, let's just imagine a hypothetical society with three classes. Now from the point of view of behavioral science, let's ask how we're going to keep the members of this society to voluntarily stay in the positions that they're placed into. Well, the guy on top is easy enough. He's on top. Obviously, he won't have to be persuaded very hard. The guy in the middle is also an easy sell. He has the motivation of, number one, riding the coattails of the top class, while, number two, the reassurance that no matter matter how bad it may be for him, it's not going to be as bad as it is for the guy on the bottom. But what about that guy on the bottom? What? Why would he be motivated to participate in a society in which he gets the worst deal? And this is a question that we shouldn't take too lightly, seeing as the vast majority of humans throughout history have been put in this position. So why? How does it work? Marx is going to say that this isn't some inherent part of human nature, but instead it's a driving mechanism in the force of history. So, as we saw earlier, the majority of cultures throughout history have been built on the notion of some type of hierarchy. But a hierarchy of what? To answer that question, let's think of culture as kind of a story with various overlapping elements. While each layer is an important conversation in its own right, Marx is going to challenge us to recognize that each piece, when taken together, explains from the culture's point of view why the dominant class gets to stay on top and why everybody else has to stay on the bottom. We call this tapestry of ideas um, a cultural narrative or from a Marxist point of view, a cultural narrative of value. And it's a story that justifies who goes where on the social hierarchy scale. Now this narrative tells us a different version of the story depending on where you are in history. Maybe the ruling class is chosen by the piety of the gods, or maybe their blood is just a little bit more noble than yours, or maybe they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps a little bit better than you did. Again, Looking at this from the point of view of behavioral science, if they somehow deserve to be on the top, that means that somehow the majority of humans belong on the bottom. The group on the bottom, obviously, will wish to improve their station in life. The options given them to uh, the options given to them to do this, however, are all woven into the cultural narrative in such a way that most of the time they'll just be digging themselves deeper into their hole. And it's when the actions that they participate in benefit the top class to the detriment of the lower class that's what's happening is called false consciousness. Now, the specific expression of false consciousness can be very diverse. It depends on what culture you're in and what class you're in and what, what place in history you're talking about. That said, this theory can be very useful for explaining some otherwise very confusing things. Like, for example, how is it that in the U.S., States that have the greatest dependency on federal aid are dominated by a political party that regularly campaigns against big government and cutting social service programs. Or, in Islam, how can it be that women justify the burqa by saying it promotes feminism? Seriously, check the links below. I'm not making this up. Or, why would anyone, anyone, be opposed to having access to affordable health care? 
or one of my all-time favorites, the Civil War. Here's a situation in which a country goes to war over slavery, and the group that's fighting for slavery was, by and large, poor southern farmers. What's weird about this is the poor farmers in the South were the ones that stood to lose the most if slavery continued, because people that had slaves could get people to farm for free. So if you can cut the labor cost to nothing, how's a poor farmer going to benefit from that system? This aspect of American history has been one of the most puzzling parts of our collective story. I don't understand that at all. It's always been weird to me. But anyways, um, Karl Popper later argued that Karl Marx's theory of false consciousness was problematic because it couldn't be falsified. That is to say, Popper was worried that Marxists would use this theory to deflect criticisms. They could just accuse anyone arguing for capitalism of arguing from false consciousness. The question of how this falsifiability works when you're arguing inside and outside cultural narratives is, however, one that we'll have to pick up some later time. That's all we have time for in this episode. Thanks, as always, for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time. Until then, thanks for watching. Keep on thinking.